Okay, thank you very much, Fern, and thank you, Fern and Kevin, for inviting me. Um, being a <coughs> person of politics, of course, I'm doing the least visual representation today, so I do apologise, there's quite a lot of text. Um, and also, I'm coming from a kind of political communications angle, just to make that clear. So, again, that may be different from some of the other issues that have emerged, although it may also fit in with some of the concerns that we've been thinking about through the course of discussions today, and also there have been some very enlightening and interesting papers, so again, I thank Bernie and Kevin for putting it together, and thank the other paper givers for providing such an interesting series of insights which have made me think in different ways, because again, the idea of interdisciplinarity is extremely useful in some of this stuff. Um, so without further ado, I will go through these slides, and uh, there's quite a few of them, so bear with me, I'll try and keep them um, to a um, relatively, uh, relatively sort of, uh, schedule. Um, I suppose broadly, um, this idea of celebrity politics, um, again, there's a lot of rise in this kind of field in terms of obviously uh, cultural studies, communication studies, and now in political science itself. And there's been increasingly a kind of recognition um, amongst a variety of writers, uh, particularly people like John Street, uh, Elizabeth Van Zunen, who I'll talk a bit about as well, about this rise of this particular kind of phenomenon. Um, and celebrity politics and politicians can be divided into different kinds of areas. John Street usefully divides them into what he calls CP1s, i.e. celebrity politicians. Those are normal elected politicians who have become increasingly celebritized. Um, we have what's called also CP2s. This is the rise of celebrities becoming increasingly politicised. And within that, I suppose, subsection, although maybe even may be considered to be now another part of this phenomenon, we have celebrities becoming politicians and having a celebrity background out of a non-traditional political background and becoming and seeking elected office, of course. Donald Trump being um, in particular of concern of my consideration today. Um, but in, again, in America, and it's not just America, but America is in the lead here. You could take it back, of course, to Ronald Reagan, who, of course, was a film actor who worked his way through the Hollywood hierarchy of unions and also became increasingly involved in right wing politics out of the Red Scare of the 1940s and 1950s and ultimately became the governor of California and subsequently the President of the United States. Um, that was a long-standing political career, that had to take 40 years, but people in 1980 were amazed that a former actor become, become the most powerful elected official in the world. Um, more recently, of course, there was a case of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governator, um, who was a particularly kind of political neophyte, um, but nothing is, I suppose, registered in terms of the idea of being a political neophyte as in the case of Donald Trump, who has also, we've heard earlier, made clear his um, antipathy towards the traditional political classes in the United States. Um, so what we've seen particularly of that trend coming together, obviously, is particularly what also we're thinking about is the rise of the social media and the extent to which the social media platforms have provided and facilitated the opportunities for celebrities, image candidates to deploy new strategies to attract constituents. So perhaps we are at a unique period of time where we're seeing more and more outsider candidates and of course they can come from different political views. Corbyn was mentioned this morning, but also we've seen other kind of figures emerging as well. Of course there was Bernie Sanders, of course, although a traditional politician, a very left-wing politician who also fought Hillary Clinton in the nomination process in 2016 as well. And, of course, in the case of Ronald Trump, of course, often uh, a right-wing presence, but also more often a reactionary populist presence, we've seen how, again, a political celebrity has constructed his brand via the social media and, again, to negotiate his position as a political outsider. So this leads into this kind of cumulative notion that we're seeing increasingly online iconic vocal and kinetic representations, enhancing what we might describe as personal authenticity. And again, this is something which, again, what is this personal authenticity? Uh, the previous paper again demonstrated construction. And of course, there is a construction of this apparent authenticity. 
and also lots of disclose parasocial relations. And that comes out of an analysis of things like fan culture. This kind of idea that there is an affiliation and affinity between people as they know the representation of that famous person. They know the famous person's representation. So this idea of how far do they occupy a process of appearing to be a real person as well. And the digital technology is of course of facilitating these new modes of self-presentation. They're fostering and enhancing, again, orchestrating and reconfiguring the nature of political celebrity. Uh, alongside that also, again, we have touched upon these ideas, but Lucas Van Zunen has also talked about, again, this idea of operating as both an insider and an outsider. And again, we've seen this in contemporary political figures. Um, Tony Blair would just be good old Tony, but again, he would present himself as being an extraordinary leader. Barack Obama was described as both Kansas and Kenya. He both had the notion, of course, of being an Afro-American who had operated himself through his narrative of a cosmic American dream, but also he was a global leader because of his uh, Kenyan descendancy as well. So again, we've seen those kind of processes taking place. So being simultaneously outside and inside, again, of course, this is something Trump has know, also played upon as well. So what I want to do in this presentation is think about kind of three broad sections. Firstly, a kind of more kind of conceptual section, thinking about what we might describe as celebrity politics in an era of what's been called post-democratic politics. Like there's post-modernism, post-structuralism, post-everything else, there is now, of course, post-democracy. Uh, this is an era wherein the traditional norms of politics are perhaps being increasingly questioned. Political allegiances, partisanship, ideologies breaking down into more kind of aesthetics and stylistic forms. Again, we've been thinking about that in political representation through the course of today's um, subjects and also papers as well. And this linkage with, obviously, the rise of the social media and this parasocial scenario and this insider-outsider status has constructed conditions of what Irving Goffman described as self-realisation. Uh, so a focus upon performativity in politics as well. Having outlined some of these conceptual ideas, then I want to refer to, again, it was presented um, earlier, uh, you even talked about Obama, and again, you can't look at Donald Trump without thinking what did proceed. It, Barack Obama's campaign and his organisation of the social media, again, develops the notion that you can develop these kind of appropriate forms of political communication strategy. And we see a move away from the periphery, as it were, um, to increasing in the centre of political communications campaigning of this embracement of the social media. This starts emerging at the end of the 20th century, but for a long time, traditional political figures, think about the social media or in internet, web 1.0 at that time, as really an add-on. But we start to see with Obama, this is intrinsic to the orchestration of the organisation of the campaign in 2008-2012, but again, principally in 2008, where he himself was, as it were, the political insurgent against Hillary Clinton in the Democratic nomination process. So she didn't have this situation just against Donald Trump. This occurred, of course, eight years earlier. And then, of course, there's Trump himself and his kind of utilisation of celebrity and social media in the 2016 campaign, looking at this in terms of the Republican nomination process. And then within the general election, we obviously the runoff with Hillary Clinton, and particularly the emphasis on the utilisation of Twitter, which Donald Trump, as we know, has taken to his heart. To the point now, an April Fool's joke appeared at the start of this week, suggesting that Donald Trump had removed himself from Twitter. Um, to the extent now, of course, that it's argued that his intellectual capabilities may be even more placed under pressure because they're going to move to 280 characters. <laughs> What does this mean to the democratic process, of course, is an underlying political concern, but also we've seen, again, Trump build upon his performativity, his apparent authenticity, uh, built around, of course, uh, a wider narrative of anti-politics. And in this respect, 
There's the gender issues, there's masculinity issues, but there's also, of course, that Trump was, with particularly Hillary Clinton, at the age of advocating himself as being the insurgent campaigner. And of course, that tied in with that kind of alt-right agenda, which, of course, he interlinked and he's now fallen out, although he falls back in with, of course, the figure of that Steve Bannon as well. So, let's have a look at the idea of this idea of post-democratic theories. And broadly, we can always say that fame and politics have always engaged with one another. Uh, you could go back to antiquity. It was also mentioned, I think, earlier on about 19th century politicians like Gladstone and Disraeli. There was also reference to Teddy Roosevelt. We could also talk about his, I believe it was his second cousin by marriage and fifth cousin by, um, by family, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and again, Extraordinary situation. If you think about FDR, this is a man who was paralysed essentially from the 1920s onwards, but would always put forward a position of health and well-being, um, an extraordinary performance that he had to engage in all the time. Um, we also have the situation that obviously within the digital media economy, that politics and celebrity are become increasingly ubiquitous in terms of an interrelationship, in terms of our contemporary culture. So, John Corner and Dirk Pels talk of, Nick Pels, excuse me, contend that the previous forms of partisan allegiances have eroded to be replaced by this, again, this post-democracy of uh, post-ideological lifestyle choices, uh, foregrounding of aesthetics and style, and again, a kind of formation of an engagement of what also has been described as so-called everyday makers. This is a term by a Danish political scholar, Henrik Bang. And again, the idea is that we have a sense of belonging and a sense of engagement, but we don't necessarily do it on the old political mechanisms of the past. So in this respect, voters have become more engaged with more eclectic, more fluid, more issue, and indeed personality-bound forms of political recognition and engagement as well. So this leads to, again, Van Zunen's idea of this, in this context, we have to also this notion of the celebrity politician appropriating of being on one side ordinary and just like us, and therefore constructing an affinity. We've seen this over and over again. But simultaneously, the idea that they have extraordinary leadership abilities and skill sets. So you can, I'm not going to read out the quote there, but again, Van Zunen basically says you can operate in the middle of that kind of plot. You can therefore become, as she described it, the ultimate celebrity politician. And of course, the medium has been, of course, the social media as well. So as we've been talking about a lot, again, Twitter, Facebook, but of course a variety of opportunities to construct memes and so on and so forth have emerged as well. But again, the political class are not immune from this as well. They understand, again, that this is, should be something that they embrace and have, as they facilitated in terms of their own fig, uh, vote, uh, cultivating their political figures. And perhaps also a term that I don't particularly like, but again, we are seeing this notion of political brands, as it were, as well. And again, this consumption, uh, cons uh, you know, consumer-based kind of culture emerging within what has traditionally been kind of the idea of political efficacy and so on. So we see in this kind of perfect storm, as it were, that this idea of parasocial interaction becomes more and more appropriate, that people start interacting through the social media, through these campaign organisation or processes, through what they believe is the kind of real person, although it's a constructed version of the person. And we see that more and more parasocial relationships emerging generally, and Miley Cyrus, all these people, Taylor Swift and whatever, having huge degrees of Twitter followers and this kind of process. And we've also seen, you know, again, celebrity careers emerging through that. But also we're seeing now political careers emerging, as it were, through these kind of processes, these kind of parasocial relationships. And this idea of we feeling we having this kind of personal affinity with the politician through their celebrity status, through their social media gathering of information and communications, and so on. So this leads into the idea that these forms of the activity create an imagined proximity between electorates and leaders, 
They alter the pace of information and communications. They reconfigure the stability of these relationships as well. Political celebrities now are able to access new platforms to dramatically realise a version of themselves that they wish the public to know. So again, there is construction going on underneath this, apparently under this apparent authenticity, although authenticity is now becoming a kind of key notion of political capital as well. And this ties in with Irving Goffman's ideas in the presentation of Self, which he wrote in 1959, which he suggests for an actor's behaviour to become meaningful to others, he must mobilise his activity so that it will express during the interaction what he wishes to convey. It is this mobilisation which he calls dramatic realisation. So that's, that's broadly the kind of overview of the conceptual side of this paper. Drawing upon Goffman's framework of self-presentation in everyday life, it can be seen that social media now affords key opportunities for this kind of impression management in which well-known figures may perform through digital sites to afford opportunities for curation, the careful collection and editing of virtual objects to provide an image of who they are and what they represent. So again, we're seeing that political figures use online platforms to build and manage these personal brands, develop personal connections, and constitute an apparently authentic idea of themselves, which apparently is direct and unmediated. So apparently you can directly speak to this person and, and communicate in a way that wasn't filtered through the traditional communication or media <coughs> channels of the past. So this e-activity that say creates this kind of particular imagined proximity between the celebrity politician and the broader electorate. So as I mentioned to you, there's the idea of Obama, and Sean Redmond, who wrote in Celebrity Studies in 2010, when he looked at Obama, he described him as a co called liquid celebrity, who was able to effectively communicate with American citizens who'd been disenfranchised by the machine politics. Remember at the time, 2008, Barack Obama originally emerges as an interesting Afro-American politician with a strange sounding name who made a very well received speech in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention. So Barack Obama needed to build up a kind of personal authenticity and information approach as well. He did this partly of constructing a political celebrity narrative uh, and also being of course an Afro-American who was standing for the most powerful office upon earth as well. But also, he utilised, again, the social media as a way and a means of, as I say, announcing himself on the national scale, and indeed the international scale, because remember that precipitity that Barack Obama particularly had in the summer of 2008, even touring Europe and going to Berlin and attracting crowds of a quarter of a million people as well. So Barack Obama's campaign, again, built upon also what had preceded it. There have been attempts by a man called Howard Dean, the governor of Vermont, in 2004, to try and construct this kind of parasocial relationship. Uh, but Barack Obama, partly because he has this particularly unique narrative, he's also a comfort in the celebrity status, and also with celebrities, and has a very close affinity, of course, with Oprah Winfrey as well. Um, also, he has another strength to his bow in this respect, He'd been a communitarian organiser in South Ch uh, side Chicago for many years, so he knew how to be getting people to be involved at a kind of grassroots level as well. And this leads to, as I say, Henrik Bang being particularly impressed about Obama's notion of directly interacting with what he describes as so-called everyday makers through this kind of interview use of information communication technologies. And the mechanism at the time was called mybarackobama.com. Uh, known as MyBo, and this mobilised 2 million users, 100,000 profiles, it allowed a kind of communitarian linkage as well, but also it relayed a kind of reciprocal relationship between this kind of liquid celebrity avatar Obama that was being constructed through the social media as well. So, We've seen therefore digital platforms can afford users the opportunity to authentically, as they see, to know famous people who they follow. Users may anticipate the possibility that they will get a response from the star or the politician or so on. 
And as a growing number of politicians are now are recognising and harnessing the social media, they also have a potential to connect and interact with political figures in a way he too for had not been possible in kind of traditional mass democracy, mass politics of the past. Now, of course, this leads us, if Barack Obama, to some degree, was the dream of this, this leads us, of course, I would construct this as, to some degree, the nightmare of where this kind of social media, celebrities, kind of interactivity takes place. So, when we think of Donald Trump, of course, obviously he is and has continued to find himself as a political outsider. He's presented himself as the, very much the businessman uh, within the political realm. Um, he has also developed an aggressive anti-politics, a nativist kind of populist brand to build relationships with audiences who feel disconnected and disenfranchised, but also appealing to the digitally savvy as well. And of course he's used the social media and Twitter to again present himself as an anti-establishment candidate and build around a kind of extreme masculinity as it were, as a man though of the establishment, not of the establishment as well. And also his own notion of draining the swamp of Washington and the whole idea of kind of underpinning and undermining the kind of lobbying power, which of course he can then blindly say, well I know how this works, I used to pay these people myself anyhow. So again, Trump developed these kind of tropes within the nomination process. In 2015, it still seems quite remarkable, we're only a few years back, the idea of Donald Trump standing still seemed to be laughable. I include myself in that. Many people thought this was a joke. Was it a self-promotional activity? And of course, at some point, Donald Trump would say something so outrageous, he would fall off the political uh, uh, mainstream as well. Well, that obviously didn't happen. Trump was able to gain a national attention. He dominated the mainstream media um, uh, discourse as well. He significantly outpaced all the grand old party Republican candidates and then uses celebrity stroke populism against the Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton. He painted himself as a political outsider, which he was also being forced with in terms of media coverage as well, which underlined his personality. And he used his strategic media and social media tool. And it had to be tied in, you know, the personality is there. I mean, the man is quite clearly egotistical and narcissistic, so you can't just do this out of nothing. There has to be this situation. He constantly wants to be you know, saturated in terms of getting attention and that kind of process. So this is something you can't also just make up. You have to have that kind of person involved in this situation. And, of course, Trump's celebrity, of course, was built up for many years. Trump is a brand. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, there's Trump Towers, you go to New York and Chicago, there's hotels, there's casinos, there's golf courses, and he's had this national name recognition well beyond his property interest in New York uh, since the 1970s and very much from the 1980s, living a kind of, you know, again, an overinflated life of the rich and famous, as it were, uh, running, as I say, real estate, casinos, resorts, golf courses, books, of course, about which he has been ghosted for, them, and even bragging he's been ghosted. And then most especially, of course, there was The Apprentice, which brought Donald Trump, uh, though he had, he had a lot of failings, both personally and business-wise, in the 1990s, to back right to and become a centre of this national brand. It's incredibly popular, activistic program that Naomi Klein has called Capitalistic Burlesque. So, in the lead up to this presidential campaign, Trump is a, a well-known figure. He has, helped, he has developed outrageous viewpoints in the past, uh, both personally, in terms of his business strategies, and then increasingly politically. He was one of, course, of the figures who was claimed that Barack Obama wasn't born an American, it was a whole birther debate as well. And on that reality TV show, was Donald Trump was the ultimate arbiter using the term, you're fired. So he constructed the absolute narrative of that television show as well. So Trump has got that kind of inbuilt celebrity, but alongside that, of course, Twitter, again, he's been the kind of perfect medium for Donald Trump. I mean, people say, well, how can Twitter be used for political communication? How can you get ideas across? Well, you don't, that's the point. You, you get things across in 140 characters. Trump has realized that 
you can do this in terms of the kind of normal posting, but of course what differentiates Trump is the blatantly hateful nature of his tweets as well. And also, of course, his definition, which again, of course, is a very American kind of process of constructing you know, a winner's world against a loser's world. And of course, also, he very much has played to this idea of hate as well. And you know, that fear of the other, again, is something which Trump has utilized in immigration, in all manner of areas, of course. And he's used Twitter particularly as his mechanism of choice as well. So this process, as I say, fulfilled a long-standing vision um, that some people have suggested. This man, Zach Moffat, who worked for Mitt Romney, said that you know, not only is this a way and a means of actually cutting campaign costs, but also the visceral nature of the platform, the 140 characters, Trump, as it were, is living the media. And that led into, of course, the then general election between him and Hillary Clinton. And throughout the course of that particular part of the campaign, Trump it was seen to average 12 tweets per day, with nearly 34,000 tweets across the whole of the campaign. His Twitter handle, at real Donald Trump, of course, suggested that the content presented was genuine and unfiltered. And again, Trump's utilization syntactical choices also, and the visual choices also are important. So he regularly refers to himself as I, and audiences as you, so he goes into the syntactical process of first person. And also, he goes bigs himself up, and bigs also any of his um, scenarios up in terms of his own worth. So you have great poll, thank you America. Trump's thank you post, but again, a sense of personal direct connection. And of course, also, he would lash out, as we know, and use the kind of, again, this kind of politics of hatred and so on. Um, so, of course, uh, the election process, if he'd failed, would have been rigged. Uh, we've had the fake media, we've had the idea of opponents being crooked, of course, that would particularly then apply to Hillary Clinton. So he would call her crooked Hillary, and then just accept of just calling her crooked. And of course, that's so tied down with also the lock her up kind of rallying kind of process which took place as well. And Trump was again able to use Twitter um, again throughout the course of the kind of running to the election debates and so on. So it can be argued that Trump mastered Twitter unlike any other presidential candidate. He unleashed the power as a tool of political promotion of distraction, of school settling, and of course outright attack. He's weaponized this information resource as well. And he fulfilled the idea that again, that you can have this urgent and visceral nature by an utilization of the social media. So what we see is that Donald Trump has shown that again, this idea that he can give voice to the irrational and project an ego which seeks constant attention. So again, this quote suggests that if we're talking about them, he is winning the war for attention. No one knows this better than Trump. Prod the social media tiger, you get attention. So Mexicans are rapists, make fun of disabled, pick a fight with the Pope, attack women, which of course we've talked significantly about, call the media dumb, and the social media shines a big bright spotlight on Donald. So, as we know, of course, Donald Trump was then, of course, to utilize Twitter and in play that way, of course, obviously, with his attacks upon Hillary Clinton, a uh, variety of different attacks, of course, this kind of looming kind of figure over Hillary Clinton in the, um, uh, the election debates as well. He even goes back, of course, to utilizing Twitter alongside his media attacks, of course, of Megyn Kelly, who had presided for Fox News over the uh, Republican nomination debates as well. So, to conclude, basically, what we've seen, therefore, is political exiles are now using their parasocial fame and social media to make claim on political leaderships. Um, a key determinant is the leader's apparent authenticity. And, of course, this is going in an era of anti-politics. Uh, again, there is a significant feeling of disenfranchisement. Uh, of course, this operates in America in both the political left and right. So you had not only Trump, but of course Ted Cruz on the nomination process. And interesting enough, the kind of Bernie Sanders insurgents campaign as well. So again, you know, again, the kind of climate had changed 
significantly. And of course, also we made reference to 2017 and Corbyn and the Momentum campaign. So again, celebrity, social media, all these kind of processes are creating new opportunities, developing, as I say, new reforms, and also obviously have, have both opportunities but dangers in terms of uh, preconceived positions and expectations. So what we saw with Trump was he lashed out his political opponents. He used the cruel humour of being the bully, but of course a bully who has you know a certain likability uh, in terms of this process. He therefore presents himself to certain groupings in America as calling it as it is, and therefore he's unfiltered through the social media, and of course his celebrity background has been one that he has been able to behave in this kind of way. Even to the extent, as we know, there was a sexual harassment issues, and of course how this would have played out post-Weinstein would have been perhaps more interesting, but of course this argument has been made, of course, that again Trump has got off the hook, that the biggest sexual harasser of the lot is in the White House. Again, Hollywood has turned in on itself and many other areas of public life, but why Trump hasn't had this place the poly is because almost our expectation is that Trump would behave like that as well. Um, he developed himself as this anti-establishment candidate, although of course he comes from, he's a skin of an extremely wealthy family, but not a political family of course. The Trumps are very different in terms of their worth, in terms of the hierarchy and status in the United States as well. And of course also he has continued to use Twitter as we know continually uh, calling out, of course, the traditional media as being fake news, even to the extent, of course, last month, of course, firing Rex Tillerson, of course, he's Secretary of State on Twitter, for Tillerson only to find out he'd been fired when he got off a plane because he didn't actually engage in Twitter. And Trump, particularly, of course, even jokes upon this, of course, in the Oscars this year, he said, you know, no stars anymore apart from your president, ha ha, kind of thing, on Twitter as well. And this, of course, ties in with the idea that Trump has developed this to enhance what Max Weber has described as his charismatic authority. So this proves his legitimacy and his determination and strength. But also in this idea of Weber talked about, the idea of you know, faithfully surrendering to him. And well, you know, again, we've seen where charismatic politicians have taken us in the past. This is highly problematic. Of course, there's also a playbook, if you want to take it back even further, to Machiavelli's The Prince here, where, of course, Trump again utilises authenticity as an apparent political virtue, although behind that, of course, tyranny may lie. Again, the question, of course, is how far can you this then take into governments? And we've seen, again, the absolute chaos of the Trump presidency. We've seen the chaos of the White House, although, again, that may be the way Trump wants it to be in terms of the way he runs things, although the falling in and falling out kind of process continues to this day. So, I suppose what we should say is that celebrity politicians, in terms of this kind of process, I think are here to stay. Um, not always, always for the bad, uh, but in case of Donald Trump, it has been extremely problematic. We're seeing this balance between inside and outside that remains vital. And again, we're seeing that there's significant changes in what P. David Marshall described as effective cap capacities across a range of political representations and narratives. So we're seeing more and more of these kind of affiliations and processes taking place. And again, this question again is something which celebrity politicians again, are you know, querying the pitch for the traditional, what you might want to call it, commentariat or whatever. Pollsters, media pundits, and indeed academics now should um, ignore these kind of trends at their peril. So thank you very much for listening to me, so thank you.